Oh, it looks like I've been crying. I've not. Um, I just came in from taking the dog out and it's really cold outside and as soon as I'm hit with cold weather, I mean, any weather really, my eyes just leak. So not, I mean, I was gonna say not emotional, but always emotional, but not actively crying right now, just leaking a little bit. Um, so um, it's been a while and that's for a multitude of reasons, mostly because my physical health and mental health have just really not been great and trying to get my butt in front of the camera when feeling like that is not easy, but today is an okay day. So I thought that I would share my favorite books from last year with you. Um, I had a lot of fun actually going through them and making this list. So I'm excited to share them and also to go through like my 2023 reading stats as well. Um, which honestly did not surprise me one bit. It felt fully predictable. So I think I'll start with the reading stats. Um, I'm gonna need my glasses for this. Um, so I read 70 books last year, which is a few more than the year before and honestly just feels like an easy manageable number for me. I didn't really, like I wasn't fighting to get any books in, I was just reading <laughs> and that came to 70, uh, which I feel like is good, like that's fine. I'm, I don't really, I don't really care so much about the number of books I read. I just care that I get some good reading done. Um, and that came to a total of 16,203 pages, which honestly, I can't really um, conceptualize that. So that doesn't really mean anything to me. Um, the top moods of my books were reflective, emotional, dark, and challenging, which seems fitting thinking about the kind of books that I read, what I enjoy. Um, yeah, no surprises there. Um, my pacing was slow books was 49%, medium 46 and fast 6, which again, doesn't surprise me. I love a slow burn of a book and books that are really pacey are definitely my least favourite. Um, page number, less than 300, 74%. 300 to 521 percent and 500 pages plus was only four percent of my reading again so predictable not surprising at all um there have definitely been a few books that are like big books that i really enjoyed but just 300 pages is just like good <laughs> um my split between fiction and non-fiction was 71 percent fiction and 29 percent non-fiction which yeah suits me fine i am a novel girl at heart that's my favorite thing to read but i do love a good essay collection so yeah doesn't again not surprising i probably could have told you all this without even looking the stats up um, my top genres were literary classics essays queer literature and memoir again you probably could have told me that i could have told me that um and I honestly think that's pretty much the same for the past like couple of years that I've been looking at my stats on Storygraph. And I don't really see that changing anytime soon in terms of pace, genre, um, my split between fiction and nonfiction. Um, yeah, my favorite books of 2023. As I said, it was actually really fun to go over what I'd read last year and kind of narrow it down into a list. Um, I stuck with the formatting that I ended up with last year, which was I did 10 fiction and five nonfiction. And I think I had a better reading year than I thought I did. And I think that's because towards the end of the year, like I feel like my enjoyment kind of tapered off a bit. Like all my favorite reads had kind of been near the start in the middle of the year and things got a little bit slower towards the end of the year. So looking back was really enjoyable. Um, these aren't in any kind of order of like favorites. It's just, I think it might be, is it 
the order in which I read them. I think, yeah, I think it's the order in which I read them, but I split them fiction and non-fiction. So first up, I have Sula by Toni Morrison, which was my first Toni Morrison, and it was a revelation. Her writing is phenomenal. It was just incredibly vivid and lyrical and just some of the best storytelling I've ever read. Um, so Sula deals with the paths of two young girls as they grow up together and become women and how it kind of looks at the archetype of uh, wife and mother versus the, the woman who refuses to fit into that box. So um, Sula goes off and travels and, you know, follows her passion and um, is a really um, interesting character in the sense that she is a woman who goes after what she wants. And I really loved her character because she's really unapologetic in a way and she doesn't shy away from, like, allowing her desires to lead her somewhere and even just allowing herself to have her desire and acknowledge her desire and you see how a community um, doesn't necessarily want to create space for a woman who lives that way. Um, there's a really good line somewhere, sorry I read this in February so trying to remember it right now, um, there's a really good line about how um, like an artist without a craft is quite dangerous. So obviously artists are emotional and expressive and they have all this passion and they channel it into their craft, like a painter, a writer, a dancer. But if, you're, if you have the temperament of an artist, if you have all that passion, but you don't necessarily have a craft to channel all that energy into, like where does it go and how does that look on a person? Like, what does it drive you to do? Who does it drive you to be? Um, yeah, I love that book so much and I just cannot wait to read more Toni Morrison. I read another one of her books with my book club later in the year and again, that was great. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to reading more of her this year. Next was a uh, short story collection, which I'm not huge on short story collections. Um, I, I just prefer reading novels, um, but I read What We Talk About When We Talk About Love by Raymond Carver. Um, this was with my book club and I every single story in it was a hit for me. That never happens with a short story collection. Raymond Carver's writing style is very pared down and economical and he kind of deals with um, the seedy underside of love. So it's not, um, it's not the kind of um, like soft, sweet, romantic love. It's more, um, it's more the friction of love and unrequited love and loving someone who maybe you realize you don't know and relationships where there's been a loss of love or even just, you know, when you're trying really, really hard to understand the love you have for someone or when someone doesn't have love for you or why you might stay with someone um, just because of love, even when you find out who they are. Love in lots of different forms. Um, I remember one of the stories just um, saying so much without really saying much at all and it was about a father and a son and they're in an, an airport uh, lounge or an airport bar and you feel so much tension underneath the surface of what they're saying like it's really it's really all in the subtext and I think it is such a skill to be able to do that and uh, Carver writes in the style of like dirty realism where it is realism but it's really focusing on you know the raw CD gritty parts of it and yeah his writing just felt so so different it was a different voice from what I was used to and it was thoroughly enjoyable um very effective some of the stories really turned my stomach and 
it provided a lot of good discussion within the book club as well. Okay, oh, um, this is my Sunny's mug, so hi CJ. I love it so much. <laughs> mm. Next up was a novel that couldn't have been more different from the writing of Raymond Carver. It's Strega by Johanna Lickehom, and I pretty much told the entire world to read this book last year. I really fell in love with it. It's this um, musical, lyrical novel about a group of um, teenage girls about 19 years old who go to a remote village to work in a hotel and whilst they're working in this hotel nobody really stays there it's like empty but they're still going about their day-to-day -day kind of mundane tasks and it's almost like the girls become this fused group they are like a chorus of girls moving through the hotel, moving through the novel, and it's very eerie and uncanny, and everything feels really beautiful, but like musty at the same time. And I think when I described this uh, novel before, I said that it was almost like there, there would maybe be some like beautiful wallpaper, like some gorgeous like, like heavily patterned like floral wallpaper that's almost a bit like saccharine sweet but if you like peeled it off a bit it would be like mouldering underneath and this book reminded me of like parma violets and like really thick dusty carpets and it was like a very sensory uh, read. Um, it was translated from the Swedish and whilst I don't read um, that language at all. I mean, I only read English. I can't really compare the texts translation wise, but it seems for that to be a translation, but to still hold so much musical musicality in its writing is like a massive feat. Um, yeah, it's really, it's really, um, it's just a very visual experience, very sensory experience. Oh God, I love that book. Yeah. <laughs> then next I have The Seas by Samantha Hunt, um, which was a buddy read with Nathan. So was Sula, actually. Um, Sula and The Seas were both buddy reads with Nathan. And this was like the first time I'd done a buddy read. Well, I think the only buddy reads I've done have been these two with Nathan. And having the ability to like discuss in like dissect a novel like whilst reading it was especially with Nathan was like really satisfying um god he has so many such an intelligent and thoughtful reader so many good questions came from both of those experiences um but the seas um follows a young girl who's in a remote town a town that is a very small tight-knit community that deals a lot with um, alcoholism and it's very dark and very heavy and very intense and when I was reading it I just kept thinking about um, like this young girl's need for like obliterating herself almost through um, like trying to find who she is through this um, unrequited love and yeah so she falls in love with um, an ex-soldier and he's quite a bit older than her and their relationship is very strange and tense and her family is broken and she's really trying to find herself through all of these people whilst knowing that there's something there's something different within her and it just leads to it just leads to a story that feels like it's falling apart as you're reading it like like if you're trying to hold like water in your hands like that tighter you try to hold it like you're still not going to be able to um like keep it from running away from you and that's kind of what it felt like reading this book um also Samantha Hunt clearly loves words and language there was a lot of really beautiful writing, really um, interesting emphasis on word use and yeah I'm so glad that this was a buddy read because I felt like I got so much out of discussing it. Um, 
Okay, then I have At the Edge of the Woods by Catherine Bromwich. And this is a book that I don't think I've spoken about on here, but I've definitely recommended to quite a few people. The story deals with a woman who has taken herself up to a remote village in the mountains and she rents a very small like cottage. It might, I think it's more like a hut um, on the edge of the woods. And again, like Sula, um, she's a woman who doesn't want to um, kind of bend herself to fit into what the you know, expected narrative of what a woman is. She wants to, you know, follow her own desires, do her own thing and be who she is. And to do that, she finds herself living at the edge of the woods. And she almost becomes, you know, a pariah because she is, um, she is daring to be different to what the expectations of a woman is. And that kind of scares the townspeople. They see her as a wild, dangerous, untamed thing and um, I think it does kind of excite some of the other town members as well but it's definitely not seen as normal, it is not um, accepted and so whenever she goes into town to maybe go uh, pick up her groceries or go to the pharmacy or something then you do feel the small community um, drawing closer to one another and whispering and the yeah, the way that it, community is explored in this novel, I definitely felt myself referencing back to Sula quite a lot. They're very, very different, but um, both dealing with tight-knit communi remote communities with women who refuse to be constrained by the traditional archetype of like mother and wife. Um, and then kind of in the middle of the book, you find out why she is taking herself away and it turns out that she was living a wholly different life before she got there and yeah it's just really interesting like what could drive someone to want to live in isolation at the edge of the woods near the wilds not near people but near the animals near nature and yeah i i really really like that book i've never read anything by Catherine bromwich before it was just something that i saw and picked up because i thought the cover looked good and it was so fully worth it <laughs> okay next is the colony by audrey mcgee which is a really like i think this one i think this i don't pay attention to the prizes or anything but i'm pretty sure this one was up for the Booker Prize or, yeah, I think it, I think it was. Um, yeah, so it was long listed for the Booker Prize. It was short listed for the Orwell Prize and the Kerry Group Irish Novel of the Year. And I can see why this would end up on so many lists. And I don't normally pick up books that are like current releases or anything like that, but I was just so drawn to the story and I'm really, really glad that um, I read this book. It is set on a small island off the coast of Ireland and it is about, I think it, yeah, it's set during the summer and two men arrive on the island. One is an English painter and the other is a French linguist and they have very different agendas, like why they're on the island and what they're there to do and how they expect to be treated and what they expect from the people who live there. And it's very much a story of colonization and legacy and, you know, expectation. And the book is punctuated by um, short bursts of what read like news bulletins of the violence um, of the troubles in Ireland. And it just it really sets the book in a very specific time and it creates a very specific tension that's just like bubbling under the surface the entire time that the book is going on. Um, we have really in interesting characters in the English painter and the French um, linguist, but they're not nearly as interesting as the inhabitants of the island and very again very close-knit community i love reading about small communities and um how they deal with outsiders um 
the French linguist JP, he is very concerned with the islanders uh, keeping their native tongue, but obviously this isn't like it it's fading away because of um, imperialism, British imperialism. And there is a young boy who wants to travel to England. He wants to be, he decides he wants to be a painter after meeting the English artist. And he doesn't want to be called by Seamus, his Irish name, he wants to go by James. And JP has a lot of strong words and ideas about who he should be, why he should be um, sticking to his, like his traditional roots, sticking to his culture. And it's very much about like the expectations of community, the expectations of tradition, um, cultural expectations, but also like the individual and the influence that outsiders have on the community. And I honestly just thought that this was so brilliantly, brilliantly written um, and yeah, I just felt like I could have kept reading and reading after it finished. It was so, so good. Um, yeah, I would, I would really highly recommend that book. Okay, next up was, this might be one of the, the best books I've ever read. And it is a book that my flatmate had recommended to me for years on end, um, East of Eden by John Steinbeck. I don't know why I did not pick this up sooner. This book was absolutely incredible. It is, yeah, one of the best books I've ever read. I could not tear myself away from it. So I read this when I went up north with my boyfriend during the summer and the weather was pretty horrendous. It really heavily rained a lot of the time up there. And um yeah, we were stuck inside a lot of the time and it was kind of the perfect reading conditions. We had this massive window that looked out onto all the hills and you could see the Isle of um, Egg and Muck and Rum and it was just like stunning landscape, pouring rain, moody clouds and I was just sitting inside with my book all curled up and reading this tale of biblical proportions about family legacy and what we pass on to our children and oh god yeah it was a really great experience um it's it takes inspiration from Cain and Abel in the bible and there are two families and the way that their family uh trauma their family legacy is passed down reflects generation to generation and you see that um some characters just seem you know doomed to repeat the past and then you see others who are determined to become their own person and do better um it also had one of the most interesting characters i've ever read like i think the character of kate was she was oh my god she was just pure chaos she was so Oh, she like reading about I I could have read her forever. She she seemed so um she just played the men. She played them and I yeah, I just don't feel like I've ever read a character like her before and she was at times she was just so evil. She was always plotting, always um, trying to carry out some sort of plan against people for her own benefit and oh god yeah she was she was thrilling really um I feel like I'm not really doing synopsis of these books very well um because it's been a while since I've read most of them but um I hope what you're getting from this is that this book was great and if you haven't read it you really really should <laughs> My next favourite read was The Late Americans by Brandon Taylor. Now this was a new release, it was uh, released last year and I I love Brandon Taylor. I will, like, I religiously read his newsletter. As soon as I get that email notification, I'm like, okay, I'm making a cup of tea and I'm sitting down to read. I love listening to podcast interviews with him. I think his writing is, it just really, really captures contemporary, um, millennial American life and he's very good at writing about like uh, 
the relationships between people and that's kind of what this book was all about it was like a group of people who were somewhat connected through through each other and the book is like a relay race so you open it and it's from the perspective i think the first perspective is is from Seamus who's um a poet um doing an MFA program and you read through his perspective and then a character who was kind of in the background they're then put into the main perspective in the next chapter and that's kind of how the baton gets passed on and you see all these connections coming together and how everyone knows everyone and what this book really does so well is how people perceive themselves is really not how other people see them at all and so you're inside someone's head and um, you're getting their perspective on what they're going through, what they're doing, what who they love, who they're with, um, their conversations, their kind of like likes and dislikes and then the baton will be um, passed on and maybe it's not until a few chapters later but the other the person from before is like reflected and you see that someone really doesn't understand what's going inside their head and they have this other I they have another idea of who they are and why they're acting the way that they are and I just thought that that was really clever <laughs> and he also writes about dance and dancers really well I think that you know being a dancer and um, I find that when I either watch things or read things that are to do with dance, it can feel really contrived sometimes and like it's trying really hard to do something but it's never quite grasping what it's actually like. Brandon Taylor does that so well, like it is so believable. There's a real mix of, um, just a, a mix of everything in this book and how it all comes together and how each part views one another and he deals with class dynamics within relationships really well. Yeah, reading this and seeing how someone from a working class background, how their um, perspective of the world comes up against their partner who might be upper middle class and who has had a lot more opportunities and doors open to them and how that can create tension and friction in a relationship and lead to like deep seated resentment and how that expresses itself. I feel like, like Brandon Taylor has done that so well and it's not really something that I'm reading in anything else just now and yeah just really engaging really interesting his dialogue is super believable as well and yeah I'll, I'm just open to listening to anything he has to say really <laughs> and then in a very different vein Pond by Claire Louise Bennett um this was such a part like this is such a perfect book I love it. It is, it feels like a novel, but also feels like short stories at the same time. Um, and this woman has, um, so it's about this woman that's living in a small cottage and about her life there in the countryside and with her neighbors and how she, she's just very introverted. And I just, the way that uh, Clara Louise Bennett can like produce like really like I feel like I'm in her books when I'm reading them. The like the the scenes are so they're so rich, they're so well developed, and you can tell that she loves language. And I love reading books by writers who don't just love to write and create stories, but they like have this like real this like real burning passion for words. And Claire Louise Bennett's vocabulary is next to none. I, I'm just astounded by the way that she writes, the sentences that she constructs. Um, her word choice is always, is always perfect to me. And it creates a very specific tone of voice that I just love and I felt that way reading Checkout 19 as well that was one of my favorite books from 2022 um I just I think that her way of writing is so fun and like subtle in a way but also just so obviously intelligent um yeah again I don't think I'm really going for synopsis here I think I'm more just giving you like the feel of a book and why I loved it um and then my last 
uh, fiction is Housekeeping by Marilyn Robinson, which was again another book that I've been wanting to read for a long time and I'm so glad I finally got round to it. This book was just everything that I needed in the moment that I read it. So I think I read this book maybe like November time and it's it's just such a cold, wet, kind of grey book. And that doesn't sound inviting, but it is what my soul wants, okay? And it's about these, um, this family, and it's mostly about the women in the family. And again, kind of dealing with how, like what you are passing down in your family line. And the book centers on uh, two sisters, two young girls, whose mother um, it kills herself and they live in a house that's been passed down through their family and the house is definitely a character within itself and the town again a small community and it felt this book felt really gothic like it felt very gothic and it was just i love reading about sisters maybe because that's because i have a sister that i'm extremely close to but how two young girls who are you know brought up in the same same way they're nurtured in the same way how they can diverge so completely and how even though they might be seen as being you know the one unit like the girls the sisters like me and my sister get called that all the time like we're just the girls the twins and how almost you're seen as like a unit but during this book you get to know each of them and they are so completely different and it's like they bring out like a strong opposition in the other i just really loved that book i loved how gloomy it was i loved the coldness of it all i loved that it was populated by like odd women i loved the sister relationship it's it's not a happy book it was it was quite bleak but it was also quite freeing in a way to see these to see some of the women being who they are, regardless of what society and community and family tell them to be. Um, and how that sometimes has the effect of, may, like that made one of the sisters really wanna construct a very specific personality for herself. Like she started to dress a certain way and only speak to certain people and hang out in specific places because she wanted to distance herself so much from the odd women of her family and yeah that book I think will be a long time favorite of mine. God I wish I was better at being more succinct when I'm talking. I really don't think it helps that it's been quite a while since I've read any of these but we're on to the non-fiction. So uh, the first one I've ha I have here is Mothers, Fathers and Others by Suri Hustvet and this was an essay collection that I read near the start of the year and it was brilliant. It was my first um, Suri Hustvet and it was like everything I want from an essay collection. And as, as the title says, Mothers, Fathers and Others, she's really speaking to um, relationships and the love within families, the boundaries within families or the lack thereof, the hate between families and just how we relate to one another. But she also um, goes on to speak about her experience um, studying at university and, you know, being a feminist philosopher at a time where you know, it was mostly men in the philosophy department and she speaks so much about art and the, her art criticism is really, really intriguing and yeah, everything that I could want from an essay collection I found in this one. Um, so if you know that your taste is similar to mine and you love reading about um, women, you love reading about literature, you love reading about relationships, you love reading art criticism, then I would suggest that you go pick this up. <laughs> and then Close to the Knives, A Memoir of Disintegration by David von Jurovich. We read this from my book club and it's a series of essays, um, which is a, a memoir of David von Jurovich's life through um, the HIV AID crisis. Oh, his writing is just incandescent. Like you feel his rage coming off the page, like, this is like it's just it is it's searing like you feel 
you feel the heartbreak and you feel the anger and like as you should you absolutely should you should feel it and just a look at how politicians just absolutely wrote off a whole group of people and used their crisis for their own political gain whilst also um reading like really intimate experiences of von Jovic's and looking at his like his friend group and losing his friends and like the beautiful relationships that they built between one another and through their art and yeah this book brought me to tears a couple of times like it was just it was so beautiful and so enraging and I think it's like I really think that it's like something you should read no matter what like this is one of those books that I feel like everybody has to read um yeah just such a like the content was obviously very important the content was obviously um like written well about but it's like the voice that he writes with was just so so effective like that tone of voice that way of writing has really stuck with me and yeah i i think i truly think that everybody should read this book um i i would preface it even though after everything i've just said i probably don't have to that it is very heavy and it's very upsetting but it's also it's also an exercise in like not looking away from other suffering and learning from it and knowing what's been done wrong and knowing um the pain that's been caused and how like I just feel like there's such a culture of toxic positivity that some people just want to turn their eye away from other people's suffering and I feel like you know we owe it to people to listen to them and especially when it was something this devastating that is something that we should all be reading about and learning from and it's just ha it just happens to be done in such an incredibly beautiful way in this particular book Next up, um, an essay collection called Death by Landscape by Alvia Wilk. Again, this was one of my book club reads and this book explored so many things. I feel like the through line of this collection of essays was um, Alvia Wilk's obsession and passion for each of the topics because they might be somewhat tenuously linked, but really I feel like the through line was just her um, passion for researching and writing these things. Um, she writes about literature, she writes about um, the environment, she writes about how those two things intertwine, she writes about um, LARPing, which I really didn't know much about, so it was very interesting. Um, she wrote about black holes, she wrote about her experience um, in lockdown during the pandemic and how that affected her relationship with her partner and it felt like as the essays went on we kind of got closer to her as a person so the first ones were kind of like quite far away and it was just something that she was very like passionate about and she'd researched it and she was writing about it and then as it moved on it was almost like we were reading her um her experience being in something and reporting about it then when you get to the end you're like in her apartment in her relationship with her partner and yeah that like, yeah it was it was really interesting fun engaging I felt like I really learned a lot reading from that book and I, I yeah I would happily go back and read it again it was just every single topic within that book was so interesting and I kind of felt like she was writing about a lot of the things that I'm really passionate about as well so it was just a total ride like I really really loved it and she is so clever like so clever it was just yeah it was great <laughs> and then uh Blue Nights by Joan Didion which is a really beautiful and devastating account of um, her losing her daughter. So uh, Joan Didion lost her husband and then her daughter in very quick succession. And when she's writing this, she's really looking back on the childhood that she gave her daughter, Quintana, 
and um, their relationship and her she's look she's really looking at her grief very intimately and the effect of loss and it it reads very much like a documentation of her life as a mother her life as, as a widow and her life having lost her child whilst also writing this you know at the end of her writing career so writing this as she's starting to I listened to an interview with her about this and she really felt like her writing had changed when she sat down to write this, that she'd um, like was starting to lose her grip on writing, lose her grip on language. And not that you can tell in this book, this book is so beautifully written, so incredibly moving. Um, but I think it it is different from her other books that I've read. And it's definitely, um, it's definitely much softer and it's very intimate in a way where you're really getting to witness somebody's grief and I just think that that's such such a beautiful thing that she's shared with us and not an easy thing to share um if you've read um the year of magical thinking then you'll know how how good Didion is writing about grief but yeah it fe it feels very different to the year of magical thinking blue nights it just feels like she's looking back on you know so much of her relationship with her husband and so much like her entire life with her daughter is in there and then what comes after and yeah it just felt like, incredibly raw and beautiful and like devastatingly sad but so beautifully written like I will never I don't see myself ever not loving Joan Didion's writing. And last on my list, I have Journal of a Solitude by Mace Arden. And this is very much journal entries. Some of them are just a few lines long. At most, they're like, what, like five pages, th three to five pages or something. So it is very much um, short journal entries. Um, not like consistently every single day, but it does cover about a year span. And May Sarton is, is a woman who loves her craft. She is a woman who's dedicated to her craft, but who is also dedicated to living a very specific type of life. And her, um, there's like this dichotomy of like, feeling really heavy and depressed and like struggling to be around people and then also just complete childlike wonder to do with nature like falling in love with the flowers that she's growing and picking them and placing them in a room and walking in and seeing them and that really making her day and it felt like such a simple book because well I mean it is just like journal entries but like it really resonated a lot with me, even though she does speak about like, she does speak about God and her relationship with um, like her faith quite a lot. And that isn't something that I have, but there's this kind of like belief in something bigger, like belief in like, um, for me, it would be like in nature, you know, in there's just, um, like a bigger a bigger scope in trying to condense that down into her everyday life and how yeah I just really loved it but she was also <laughs> entirely relatable where she was like I just don't want to be around people um socializing is difficult socializing exhausts me I can't wait to get back to my beautiful little home and spend time by myself and yeah that was just really it was just really enjoyable to read moments where I could be like, oh yeah, I know what that feels like. Or just like reading something and having it be a little reminder that the little things in life are so magnificently beautiful and that doesn't have to be a little thing. That's my favorite books from last year. Like I said a couple of times, I didn't exactly do a good synopsis. I wasn't succinct through any of this, but Hopefully there's a few recommendations in there that you can take away and maybe it'll become a favorite book of yours. I would really, really love to hear what your favorite book from last year was. So please drop that in the comments because 
I'm always looking for new recommendations of things to read. And if you've read any of these, loved them, hated them, really felt nothing about them, then let me know as well. I'm excited to chat with you in the comments about our favorite books and hopefully I will see you again really soon.